Support for Trail of History provided by Bragg Financial Advisors, providing portfolio management and comprehensive planning advice for high net worth clients and institutions. Committed to our clients and to our community. BraggFinancial.com. This is a production of PBS Charlotte. What do milk bottles, antique embroidery, handcrafted face jugs, dioramas of historic battles, and nostalgic toys all have in common? They're all collectibles. I became obsessed with retaining my original childhood toys. Some collections, well, they can take up entire rooms. For 45 years, I've collected as much as I could possibly uh, get. But as you can see, I'm, I've run out of room too. And what motivates a collector is as unique as their collection. You know, the hunt is really neat, no matter what you're collecting. We go out and look for things that we love. 95% of everything in our house is an antique. Join us as we explore unique and varied collections from the Charlotte region. We'll meet those with the itch to hunt for rare items, a couple that credits collecting together as a secret to a successful marriage. Then learn how one man's collection of miniature soldiers inspires a local artist, and meet a collector who turned his hobby into his full-time job. That's all coming up on A Trail of History. For generations, people have been collecting everything from coins, baseball cards, antiques, jewelry, and even classic cars. What motivates people to take up the hobby can range from reliving a childhood to an appreciation for the craftsmanship. But for one collector, it's all about family. There's an advertising slogan from the 1980s that goes, milk, it does the body good. Well, here in Lincoln County, milk has been good to the Haynes family for more than a century. My grandfather started Haynes Dairy in 1914. He uh, took dairy products to Lincolnton uh, by horse and wagon. My name is Paul Haynes Jr. and uh, I've worked in the dairy business all my life and my grandfather and my father worked all their life and then I have uh, two sons that's continued uh, with me and uh, also as a hobby, I'm a dairy collector. And when Paul says he's a collector? Most people would say it's a dairy museum, but due to most of it has Elsie the cow and other cow items, I call it the Haynes Dairy Museum, spelled M-O-O-S-E-U-M. There's approximately 1,500 pieces of, of Borden's. Uh, the Borden family, Elsie was the cow, and Elmer was the bull, Beauregard was the boy, and Beulah was the girl. And the collectibles that you see here and the other collectibles other people have, most of it evolves around the Borden family. But before Elsie the cow moved into the Haynes Museum, Paul Haynes says he started a bit closer to home. Well, the starting point, I wanted to get all the Haynes dairy memorabilia that my grandfather and my father had, and they put out a, a good bit. And I'd find a piece here and a piece there. It was very hard to, to, to put it all together. We naturally had some of it. Well, these are the cartons that started with my grandfather. And then my daddy uh, followed up behind it. Well, this is one that my granddaddy had. And the first thing you notice how heavy it is. Haynes even has cartons featuring the famous Western character Wild Bill Hickok, played by actor Bill Elliott. Along the way, he's picked up items from other local dairies as well, such as Cabarrus, Biltmore, and Sunrise. But it's the Borden Dairy Collection that consumes the space. That brand is a standard brand, just like Coca-Cola and Pepsi. It'll, it'll always be around, and I don't think Elsie will ever be forgotten. The more rare the Borden's items are, the more I sought after them. And of course, we have a lot of just the everyday items, pencils and hats. The cookie jars are, are pretty common. And now it's almost impossible to find anything else. I especially like to find rare pieces. Uh, I have a marionette that uh, I think is a, a, a one of a kind piece. 
I have a contact salesman trained and I, and I have it where I can run it. I think there were about five sets made that American Flyer made for Borden's and I'm lucky enough to have two. But the marionette sits at the top of his list. The marionette's probably my most favorite piece because it's the rarest. Uh, they, Borden's made commercials off of that marionette and uh, there were a few of those made, but it being a string puppet, I'm sure the strings broke and nobody knew how to fix it or that type of thing. And, and uh, I put a glass cover over to keep it from collecting dust and try to take real good care of that. Another rarity, this life-size animatronic Elsie the cow that once greeted visitors to a Borden's processing plant. That is the cow that they had over at High Point where the milk and ice cream was made. And uh, she, she has a, uh, she talks to the customers. Today, Paul Haynes and his sons continue this fourth generation family business, distributing milk and ice cream around the region. The business may have inspired this collection, but Haynes says there's something bigger going on at the Haynes Dairy Museum. This collection represents family history, generations upon generations of a family, and their life here. I hope to keep this for the future Haynes's to come in and look and enjoy. Uh, I think they can understand the time, effort, money, and trips that it took to put a collection like this together. And as long as they enjoy it, it's, it's worth a lot of money to me. That's the value of the collection, is people enjoying it and asking questions. Not everyone collects just one genre. Some collectors like variety. Welcome to the home of Terry and Richard Garrett. And everywhere you look, there are antiques from all over the world. We collect a lot of different things. We go out and look for things that we love. It's, usually it's an antique. Their world journey through antiques and collectibles started more than 35 years ago. My wife and I met in uh, Clarksville, Tennessee, and uh, one of the things that we both enjoy is antiques. When Richard and I started dating, I introduced him to the lady that sold him the clocks. That started the collection, I think. And over time, we just love to go together and collect and, and collect things. And according to Terry, the couple that antiques together stays together. Both of us work demanding jobs. When we married, uh, we started moving. And it was a common thread of, well, let's find something in Tennessee. Let's find something in Arkansas or Mississippi or Iowa. Even though the house was different, the things were in different rooms, it gave us a footing that we felt like we were joined then. It kept us together, where a lot of families don't, don't survive 35 years of marriage. It kept us together. It's fun to watch him when he finds something that he actually really loves. Uh, and it's great, it's great if we both love it. Just gravitate toward things that we love and think are beautiful. Terry enjoys just about anything English. That's evident by what she calls the hunt room. But she admits their home decor comes with a multicultural flair. I fell in love with English furniture, English decorating, in anything English. But then I ventured on and I started into French. So now our house is a combination of American, English, French, uh, Japanese when you talk about porcelains. It's a conglomerate of all these things that we have loved. Richard's interests range from classic stereo equipment, like these massive Bozak speakers. My speakers are called Concert Grands. They were designed to sound just like a concert when you sat in front of them. To Asian porcelains, Napoleonic figurines, and clocks, interests stemming from his career as an engineer. We have porcelains, a lot of Asian, Japanese Amari, English, Staffordshire, a lot of cut glass. I, I was a ceramic engineer. That was my degree in college. So I gravitate toward porcelains, glass, that type of thing. I have a lot of clocks. I love, love mechanical things. Being an engineer, I love mechanical things. And they were built to last. You know, some of these things are 150, 170 years old. They still work. You can still get them repaired. Richard enjoys digging into the history behind the clocks. Uh, the French farmers, basically, they made more billets in the south of France. And they usually did it in the winter months. 
Uh, that clock in there is probably from about 1880, 1870, 1880. I think the colors in it, the, uh, the, the, the pendulum, the face is painted tin and it's just remarkable. Even in, in the pendulum, there's a ship in the bottom that actually, as it moves back and forth, you can see it move over the wave. And I think that, the, the sound of it, it's just, uh, the painting of the, the case itself. Uh, I just I just think it's a beautiful clock. I, I just love the colors. And while he enjoys clocks, Terry has an affinity for textiles. She collects all kinds of handcrafted pieces, like this fireplace screen that once served an important purpose. Back in the early years, women, when they wore makeup, their makeup was made of wax. And they would sit beside the fireplace to stay warm. This screen was put up beside them to block the heat on their face because if it didn't block the heat, the wax would melt off their face. But they made them decorative. But there's one very particular type of antique textile that she's drawn to. Antique original samplers. And I got interested in samplers because that back then was the only way that girls got educated. They did not go to school. And schooling is very important to me. And I thought, this is their history. They put their name, their date. Sometimes they would put their parents' names. This was a history of their life. Richard admits they do have a concern. What will happen to their collection when they're gone? Hopefully there'll be a new generation that will appreciate what they have and uh, collect it like we do and love it and take care of it. Because you don't take care of it and love it, it's going somewhere and it's probably not a good place. But for this couple enjoying retirement and more than three decades of teamwork collecting, it's been worth every mile on the road, every estate sale, and every trip to a flea market. It's been a passion. I mean, we, every weekend we would go out and it's like a scavenger hunt, go see what you can find. And uh, we went to estate sales, auctions, dealers. I mean, wherever it was, we'd go look for it. And absolutely enjoyed it. The Garretts enjoy diversity in collecting, but up in Mooresville, a singular genre is the motivation. Step into this room and you might feel as if someone or something is watching you. Multiple sets of eyes from all angles. You're surrounded by face jugs, all of them belonging to this man. Uh, my name's Adam Hilton. I collect mainly Catawba Valley pottery. I'm a collector at heart. I've always been, you know, from when I was a kid, collecting baseball cards. Since starting the collection in 2015, he says he's amassed about 250 examples of Catawba Valley pottery, a type of pottery with deep roots in North Carolina. The Catawba Valley pottery is um, defined as an area, um, a location, mainly Catawba and Lincoln County. Um, it's a historical uh, pottery epicenter where back in the early, mid 19th century, folks were making pottery for utilitarian purposes, jugs, churns, things like that. And then it's evolved into um, what I collect, which is more of the, the faces and the swirlware and things like that. Some people collect all different kinds of face jugs from various states. Some people collect only North Carolina face jugs. Some people only Catawba Valley. And then some people like me, and it's probably a, a smaller portion, but they're more specialized you know, by the potter. So there's folks that collect just Burling Craig or just Charlie List. Hilton's collection ranges from large to small, many with unique and quirky features. And a bulk of his collection was made by a single potter named Charlie List. I just really like the, um, the expressions and the fact that they're, they're different. The majority of what I have are face jugs. I have a handful of pieces that don't have faces. Some of the potters like, um, Charlie, they make roosters now and pigs and piggy banks and you know just about everything you can imagine, snakes. A lot of these jugs have snakes on them, so that's just another thing that's kind of a way that it's um, transitioned over the years. It's hard to pick a number one piece out of, out of, of a collection, but it's the number one owl that, that Charlie made and it's red, so that makes it really, really unique. But the fact that it's marked first owl makes it pretty special. Hilton says there are hundreds of years of tradition and history behind each jug. The thought is that enslaved Africans brought the tradition from Africa over to uh, mainly an area in South Carolina called Edgefield. There's still some 
edge filled face jugs that come up at auction every once in a while and bring lots and lots of money. They're really um, coveted, you know, for their historical value. Um, those were used, it's thought back, back then by those folks as um, grave markers and things like that. Today, most face jugs serve as decorative folk art, but Hilton says that wasn't always the case and appreciates the legacy of the Catawba Valley pottery he collects. Early to mid 19th century, before glass and well before plastic, you know, these were storage jars. They were jugs for molasses. They were churns for churning butter. Uh, so I think it's really neat that those are still the forms that are being used today. So they, they may have a face on them, but the actual form itself is you know, what was being used for that utilit utilitarian purpose. Collecting face jugs turned into such a passion that Hilton heads up the Face Jug Collectors Group on Facebook with more than 2,000 members. He says social media today is where most collectors buy, sell, and trade these unique creations. At auction, some more historical jugs and those done by well-known potters can go for some serious money. Some of the Edgefield face jugs, you know, they fetch $100,000 and, and, you know, in that ballpark, you know, 25, 50, 100,000. The Berlin Craigs, which are some of the more coveted that are a little easier to get um, than obviously the Edgefield are. Um, you know, a good, nice Berlin Craig could be two, three thousand, something like that and up. Hilton is now passing his hobby down to the next generation. We've got a five-year-old daughter and she's been to a number of kiln openings and she picks pieces and she has little animals from Seagrove and some, yeah, the fact that she, um, you know, enjoys it and appreciates it and, you know, and I think it's something that we can do together. With his collection, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and Hilton had to make one concession when putting it out on display. My wife understands the collection. She appreciates the, the history, but she's not as into the fact that they're all faces and they all kind of look like they're staring at you. Um, so that's one thing that you know, she, she understands and appreciates, but she's not quite as into it as I am. So I have um, promised her, and I've, I've had a little bit of flexibility for a few pieces here and there throughout the house, but basically, this is going to be my pottery room and I'll make sure that all the, especially the really, the more creepier ones will, will stay in here. <laughs> so in this room, his pottery must stay, but it's proudly displayed and enjoyed, not tucked away in a closet, something Hilton says collectors should keep in mind. You know, the hunt is really neat, no matter what you're collecting, but what you, if you appreciate once you have the item, I think that's, you know, that's what's really important. The face jugs and Catawba Valley pottery are artistic expressions with historical roots in North Carolina. Back in Charlotte, one history lover's collection now serves as an inspiration for digital art. On guard and at the ready, a massive army stands prepared for battle. But in a private office? We are in the Waterloo Room. This is one of over five rooms that, we've, that I've designed in this collection. An extensive collection of toy soldiers put on display by artist Dan Nance. With this, there's over 10,000 figures, and uh, this stuff comes from all over the world. Um, it's uh, some of the most beautiful, handcrafted, top shelf stuff. The twist, the collection actually doesn't belong to Nance, but to his longtime friend and history lover, Cameron Harris. As a kid in the 10 to 12 year age, mom and dad uh, gave me some, a set of toy soldiers uh, from Abercrombie and Finch. And I just, every Christmas, I was looking forward to getting another set. And he did what any kid would do. He played with them. I uh, put them out in the yard and and then throw firecrackers at them like a bomb going off and that sort of thing. And it was kind of fun. And so that got me started. And then uh, along comes my son. And so I gave them to him and, and he was doing the same thing and he was tearing them up. And I said, well, gosh, that's not the right thing to do. So then I would start substituting plastic soldiers in there for his, uh, the metal soldiers. So that, uh, and then kind of putting them over to the side and, that's how the collection really got started. And as you can see, his collection grew exponentially. Each individual figure can cost between $50 and $300. Harris says he searches the world for the highest quality figures from countries like Russia and Great Britain. The Russian market, the highest quality soldiers are coming out of there. Britain's is doing a better job now than they used to, and you're getting some pretty high quality soldiers out of that but the real painting ones come out of Russia. 
Nance designs each of the intricate dioramas to depict various military engagements throughout the world and through the ages. They include World War II, the Civil War, and this one from Africa, inspired by the 1964 classic movie Zulu. The partnership and friendship between Harris and Nance started more than 20 years ago. I liked his artwork and uh, we started off with the Civil War and I've always liked history. So I had Dan do a couple of pictures uh, and uh, it just kind of evolved into a whole lot more. A whole lot more might be an understatement. We moved recently. I took it upon myself to say, all right, look, let's pull it all out. Let's bring all your stuff out, because just recently you just showed me the closet where you have all these boxes just boxed up. We're going to pull them out, and I'm going to set them up. You're going to let me set them up. We'll do it my way. Let me create a showcase for you. Now, Harris can truly enjoy the collection that started with a fateful Christmas present as a young boy. And as for Nance, the historic artist who's made a career painting on canvas, well, his embracing technology with mixed mediums and the toy soldiers, they're the stars. I paint in the morning usually paint uh, f a few hours in the morning and then I'll go over and uh, create some digital work in, um, and, and it's almost like going into a studio and uh, producing other uh, vignettes. Nance, who originally wanted to be a filmmaker, takes still images from the dioramas and blends them into these animated short vignettes. History's cool. History's neat. It's a great setting and you can learn from it. I mean, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's a challenge. It's always been a challenge to teach young people about it in school. That's how it's led to these, these creations, these vignettes I'm doing with these military miniatures, is I have the access to do that and this incredible opportunity. So in laying these out, you get to construct these whole worlds and then I bring it into the iPad there and that's my DreamWorks studio right there. It's got everything you need. So that paired with that, paired with this, paired with what's up here and you, you know, it's, it's limitless. Your imagination just goes wild. And as for Harris, well, he's got ideas for future expansion with his collection and dioramas. In the long run, uh, you know, my wife may see this, and if she does, that she's not going to be real excited with what I'm getting ready to say. But I, you know, it would be hard not to do uh, Gettysburg. Every collector has a reason for building their own personal collection. I became obsessed with retaining my original childhood toys. Meet Lou Veloso. Family His family immigrated from Germany in 1993. Uh, I couldn't bring any of my childhood toys with me. So I always had this longing for my Masters of the Universe figures, for my Star Wars figures, Transformers, my little video games. I had Nintendo. And it's just always been kind of sitting in the back of my mind. You know what? I wish I still had that. So he set down the path to reclaim his childhood. In New Jersey, uh, where I originally moved to, they had the Meadowlands Flea Market every Wednesday and Saturday morning. So on Saturday mornings, I used to go wake up super early, 5 a.m., and just go hunt for Masters of the Universe figures, Transformers, you know, the toys that I played with. What he didn't know at the time was the journey to collect his own childhood toys was about to turn into a business. It's called Bergen Pickers. What a picker does is essentially goes on the hunt for nostalgic items. And you look for items that people want, that collectors are you know, looking for. He says collecting and running his own business changed the direction of his life. I went into marketing, did that for 10 years, and, but I was just never cut out to be in the monkey suit. It was just, it was torture, you know, but with that, I, you know, the positives I took from it was, you know, how to promote a business. Veloso works from home and unleashes the power of the internet to connect items with his customers and promote his business. Hey guys, Lou with Bergen Pickers. Today we're checking out the Star Wars Return of the Jedi Battle Damage Imperial TIE Fighter Vehicle. Uh, YouTube is just fun. You know, YouTube is where I talk about the things that I come across, you know. Just to review a little information about uh, what this toy was all about. Neat items, like for instance, there was a uh, wind-up roller coaster that I found. So I figured, hey, you know what? This is probably something that not everybody has seen, and it's old, and it's cool. So I made a video of it. In the world of picking, one of his favorite types of finds is what he calls forgotten gifts. It's the best stuff. It's, uh, usually grandma you know, goes out and buys some gifts, you know, some, you know, some toys, but forgets to give them. One find in particular stands out for Veloso. Original Star Wars toys from 1977, of which uh, Boba Fett 
was one of them, and, and that was probably the the best find I ever had, you know, because it, it it sold for a pretty penny. And we were lucky enough to to then sell it for what was an eBay record at the time, um, and it was uh, seventy five hundred dollars. Veloso says picking is real work and not necessarily a way to get rich quick. This is a highly specialized service. It, it, it takes a lot of work and effort and research and um, a lot of blood, sweat and tears, a lot of mistakes, you know, a lot of trial and error. You also deal with a tremendous amount of competition. As a toy picker, Veloso sees a variety of items, things like classic video games, this Ghostbusters film crew jacket, action figures, and even a working Teddy Ruxpin. But there's one toy line that he avoids. Did you just say Beanie Babies? Yeah. If, if I were Superman, Beanie Babies would probably be my kryptonite. Beanie Babies, we got so many calls about Beanie Babies, and because they were so popular, I understand why everybody thinks they're worth a lot of money now. It's what I call a manufactured collectible. It was not an original toy line like Master Universe, Star Wars. You know, when it first came out, it was made to sell to you to collect. Those collectibles usually do not appreciate in value. Some do. Not all of them. Beanie Babies, bottomed out big time. And he has this advice for collectors. I would not recommend collecting for investment purposes. When you collect, do it because you love to do it. You know, do it because you have a passion for it. If you like baseball, collect baseball cards. Forget about the money, just enjoy doing it. If you have kids, do it with your kids. Call it passion, an art form, the secret to a successful marriage, or an entrepreneur's dream. Collecting allows you to recapture history, personal history, as well as a living history. They're symbols of a time and place precious to each of us, proof of life before for the generations to come after. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Trail of History. Production of PBS Charlotte.